This is Because I Said So, parenting advice with love and leadership from the nation's leading parenting expert, John Roseman, syndicated columnist, author, conference speaker, and the only psychologist to point out that psychology has caused more problems than it has solved. From American Family Radio, here's your host, John Roseman. Hello and welcome to another exciting episode of Because I Said So with your host, moi, John Rosemond, heretic, family psychologist, author of some, depending on how you count them, between 15 and 20 books on parenting and family issues, uh, internationally known, wow, <laughs> public speaker, um, let's see, what else, uh, husband of 50 years to the same woman, Willie is her name. Father of two now 40-something-year-olds and grandparent to seven, ranging in age from 14 to 23. I think I tend to lose track. If you want to learn more about my parenting and family ministry, you can go to John Rosemond, and it's J-O-H-N-R-O-S-E-M-O-N-D dot com. You can find my speaking schedule there, where I'll be in upcoming weeks and months. The last several columns from my nationally syndicated newspaper column, which may or may not appear in your area. And if it doesn't, go to your uh, local newspaper and tell them that uh, it's free. All they have to do is uh, run it as living with children and run my photograph and a brief tagline and they can have it for free. No other strings attached. How about that? So one of uh, my messages or one part of my message is that the raising of children is really quite simple. It's not complicated. We made it complicated in the late 60s and early 70s when we began listening to people like me. What do I mean by that? People who populate the mental health professions, psychologists mostly, tell us how to raise kids. We, in so doing, substituted a child rearing based on bogus psychological theory and therefore bogus professional advice for a child rearing that was based predominantly on biblical principle. In other words, as the schools were doing with prayer, so the American parent did with parenting. We through God out of the process. And we've been paying a pretty terrible price for that ever since. And more specifically, the people who have been paying the price are America's children and America's mothers. In the last 50 years, the mental health of the American child has deteriorated by a factor of 10. Now, now pick up on the irony of this, ladies and gentlemen. Since we have been listening, since the American parent has been listening to psychologists and other mental health professionals advise us on how to raise children properly, the mental health of the American child has deteriorated by a factor of 10. Today's child by age 16, when compared with children in the 1950s, is 10 times more likely to experience a serious emotional setback. 10 times more likely. And the American parent doesn't seem to get it because almost invariably, as problems in the raising of a certain child accumulate at some point, The typical American parent picks up the phone and calls a psychologist. Well, folks, here's the simple fact. People in the mental health professions are not going to be able to help you with problems that are caused by advice from the mental health professional community. It's just that simple. If I was a conspiracy theorist, I would think, wow, what a scam. You give bad advice and then you profit from it. And by the way, I am a conspiracy theorist. I do believe that there was another shooter or shooters on the grassy knoll. 
and I don't believe Antonin Scalia just died in his sleep. But anyway, back to the subject at hand here, which is what we call parenting. So I'm going to toot my own horn here. Uh, in so doing, I've, I've got to tell you that as a biblically grounded evangelical, I'm taking a huge risk because I am told in the word that I am not to promote myself. So how do I rationalize what I am about to do? Ah, yes, I can say without a trace of guile that since my message to parents is not mine, but rather his, with a capital H, that I am but a messenger. I am not promoting myself, therefore, I am simply proving that indeed the truth does, in fact, set people free. Oh, just realized I forgot to uh, elaborate on the fact that mothers have also paid a terrible price for listening to mental health professional advice. Over the last 50 years for the American mother, child rearing has gone from something that was a relatively easy, straightforward, commonsensical, down to earth, uh, not highly stressful by any stretch of the imagination to the single most stressful thing that a woman will ever do in her entire life. And of course, I'm not talking about all women. I'm talking to an average, a norm here. I mean, I've even had, this is tragic. I have even had women tell me that if they had known how difficult and stressful the raising of one child was, that they would never have elected to have even one child. Well, here's a fact, folks. If you discard God from any area of life, that area of life is going to become problematic. And that's what we did. I mean, even in the Christian home, folks, l listen, as I go around the country in my guise as a public speaker, and yes, that was my cell phone in the background, and I have put it on airplane mode. So anyway, on with the show here. This past Monday morning, I spoke to uh, a mops group at Temple Baptist Church in New Bern, North Carolina, which just happens to be my hometown, as many of you already know. New Bern, two words, B-E-R-N, very historic, pretty town, 35,000 people, but jumping with cultural opportunities and good restaurants on the eastern uh, in the eastern part of the state, uh, right on the Noose and Trent Rivers. My wife and I have been here a little over three and a half years, and we just love it. And by the way, for those of you who would be interested, I am doing a two-day, what I call Parent Retreat Weekend on Friday and Saturday in late June here in New Bern for a small group. I'm taking no more than 20 parents and uh, locking them in a room for two days and taking their parenting apart and putting it back together again. Uh, we're going to have a lovely dinner at a lovely restaurant here in town and a private dinner, and we're uh, going to have a mixer here at uh, our house one evening. So if you'd like to be part of that group, go to my website, johnroseman.com, and you can sign up for it. So I... Uh, uh, I spoke to this mops group for about 90 minutes, all told, and during which I said that God's word is sufficient for all things. Scripture is sufficient for all things, including the raising of children, and explained, as well as I'm capable, what scripture says about children and how to properly raise them, properly meaning according to God's instructions. And I talked about how to properly apply those instructions to the proper discipline of children. It's very simple stuff, really. The understandings in question are already written on our hearts. God has prepared us for raising his children properly. This is not a practical joke that he has played on us. He wants us to do this properly, and he has given us an adequate set of instructions with which to do so. Uh, we all, and mothers especially, dare I be so non-egalitarian, simply need to get back in touch with biblical principle and biblical instruction concerning the rearing of children, 
get back in touch and back in sync with this stuff. So later that same day, I received the following email from a woman who leads the MOPS group in question, actually the two women who lead the MOPS group at Temple Baptist here in New Bern. And uh, here's what the email says. And it's from one of the moms in attendance that morning. Many of the moms who attended, well, actually, this first part is from one of the leaders of the group. Many of the moms who attended have already commented about what a positive impact this morning's presentation has had for them. Here's what one mom said just this afternoon. Now, this is like three hours later. After coming home and following John's instructions, and they're really not my instructions, I'm just interpreting God's instructions and, and, and kind of demonstrating in front of the group how to apply these instructions to various parenting situations. After following John's instructions for five minutes, I realized this stuff works. I am shocked. I am enjoying my afternoon, and my toddler picked up her own toys. And the same mom then follows up with, she, my daughter, asked about dinner. I told her it was chicken Alfredo with broccoli. She said she was not going to eat it with broccoli. She wanted it without broccoli. I told her I wasn't fixing special dinners anymore that a doctor had told me that she needed to eat her food without complaining or go to bed right after dinner. And my toddler daughter said, okay, and later ate her entire dinner without a word of complaint. What a wonderful thing it is to not have to listen to frequent tantrums. And then the women who lead the MOPS group, the older women who lead the MOPS group in question, said... Thank you for blessing us so richly. And my response to her was, I accept those compliments in his name. As it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and he will keep your path straight. Okay, folks, we'll be back right after this break from American Family Radio. Stay with us. So welcome back to the show. I'm John Roseman. The show is called Because I Said So, and it is all about what we call in America today, parenting. What an interesting word, parenting. It's formed by taking a noun, parent, adding ing on the end, and transforming it illegitimately into a verb. Like uh, other words of the same sort, uh, trucking, hoeing, gardening, hammering. In other words, folks, when you take a noun and you add ing to the end of it and you transform it into a verb, the verb in question is almost always about work. And so it is no surprise, is it, that today's parents and mothers especially regard what is now called parenting as work. When mothers in previous generations, uh, I'm talking about my mother's generation being the last generation of women who reliably felt this way, and generations before that, felt that uh, the raising of a child was just something you did, that it was a natural, normal part of a natural and normal life, that it was not work, it just was. As a 95-year-old woman told me once, I was sitting next to her on an airplane going out to California, and we had a lot of time to talk. And, and by the way, 95, she had raised her children in the 30s and 40s and early 50s, and her children were five of them, I believe, all successful, doing well, uh, you know, no nervous breakdowns, no, uh, no incarcerations. And, um, I, I, you know, we were sitting next to each other and she'd gotten on the plane without any assistance, no wheelchairs, no anything like that. And, um, she was quite, uh, mentally alert and, and spirited. And she was going, uh, to California to visit her first great 
great grandchild. What a blessed life she has led. And uh, in the course of this conversation with her, I, I, I asked her this question. I said, let me, let me, I'm curious about something. When you were raising your children in thirties, forties, early fifties, did you, and did your female peers, did you generally feel that the raising of children was difficult, that it was uh, stressful, hard, that it uh, required great concentration, great thought, that you needed to read a lot of stuff in order to know how to do it properly? And uh, did it wear you out on a regular basis? And she looked at me <laughs> with this puzzled uh, look. And, uh, and, and I got to tell you, she was smiling slightly, so it wasn't completely puzzled. She must have known what I was talking about. I was talking about this generation of mothers. And uh, she said, no, John, of course not. It was just something you did. What a healthy attitude. Just something you did. Like eating a meal, getting up and getting a glass of water, putting on your clothes. Just something you do. Why, why has it become something other than just something you do? Why has it become for the all too typical, all too average American mother, why has it become something burdensome? Why has it become so difficult? Why do women all over America tell me that this thing that we now call parenting is the hardest thing they've ever done in their lives, the most stressful thing that they've ever done in their lives. You, you know, when I, in front of an audience, ladies and gentlemen, when I say, please answer yes or no collectively to the following, parenting has become bad for the mental health of women. There is a chorus of yes. Nobody says no. And I, by the way, I make it clear, I'm not talking about every single mother, but even mothers who don't experience the raising of children these days as stressful, burdensome, difficult, anxiety arousing, anguishing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, they know that those adjectives apply to most of their female peers. And the answer to my own question is quite simply, we tossed God out of the equation in the late 1960s and early 1970s when we began listening. And, and folks, b before I go any further with this, you know, this is a theme that I, I come back to regularly in this show. And why do I come back to it so regularly? Well, for the same reason that Rush Limbaugh talks about liberalism so regularly. Liberalism, to him, has become a poison in culture, American culture, and he talks about it. And I believe that mental health, professional parenting advice has been toxic to child rearing and has been toxic, therefore, to the family and has been toxic, therefore, to school, community, and culture. And so I talk about it. And yep, I talk about it on a regular basis. Why has the raising of children once regarded as, you know, something you, as the 95-year-old woman on the airplane said, just something you do, just something you do. How has it become transformed in 50 years from just something that you do, a normal, natural part of life, into the single most stressful thing that a woman will do in her adult life, entire life for that matter? And the answer is because we tossed God out of the equation in the late 1960s, early 70s. And we began listening to people who represent 
what is arguably the single most atheistic profession in America. Mental health people, psychologists primarily, clinical social workers. You know, the, the, I said arguably. It is possible that the field of journalism is populated percentage-wise by more atheists than the mental health professions. But uh, I'm going to tell you, the, if, if, if so, it's only by a nose. Regular listeners to the show know that I was an atheist until around 1992 when I began reading books that argued against Darwin's theory and by his grace, I am an intellectually honest individual and uh, so came to the realization that uh, Darwin's theory was bereft of evidence and bereft of logic and that there was only one evidence-based logical explanation for the existence of the universe and every single atom within it, and that was God, a creator God. Now, I didn't accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior until about eight years later in the year 2000 as a consequence of reading another book by, in this case, Lee Strobel, The Case for Christ, a former atheist who himself came to Christ through a logical, rational process. But as a consequence of my own history, I can look back and realize that my entire graduate school indoctrination was an indoctrination in a secular, humanist, behaviorist, Freudian worldview. And as a consequence, you know, what, what all of those uh, labels boil down to is an atheistic worldview. Every single major psychological theorist, Sigmund Freud, Carl Rogers, Abraham Maslow, B.F. Skinner, the whole nine yards, they were atheists. And we, we were seduced into believing that these people, because of the capital letters after their names and their impressive titles, knew what they were talking about. And we headed down a road never traveled by any culture at any time in the rearing of children. And we have paid a terrible price for this. As Robert Frost says in his poem, you know, the, we took the road never traveled and it has made all the difference. Yeah. When you toss God out of any equation, you're not going to make things better. <laughs> The fact of the matter is, folks, that he is sovereign. When you deny his sovereignty in any area of your life, you will bring down problems on your head. And, and this is what's happened in America. And, and here's the thing. You know, I talk about this a lot, but in, in the final analysis, this problem is easily cured. And the woman who attended the MOPS program, by the way, the leaders of this MOPS group have told me since that the positive feedback has continued to flow in such that they have scheduled a special meeting, a 90 minute meeting for them to just ask me questions. And, you know, folks, I am not promoting grace based parenting and I am not promoting attachment parenting and I am not a pro uh, promoting gentle parenting, as I have said in, in recent shows. I am promoting nothing more than God's instructions concerning children and how to raise them properly. It is biblical parenting. It is the truth. And the solution to the parenting problems that we are having in America today at a widespread level is very simple. It's simply replacing lies with the truth. Folks, I hope you've enjoyed listening to the show as much as I enjoy doing it. And I am here every Saturday, 6 o'clock Eastern, 5 o'clock Central, all across America on American Family Radio exclusively. I will hope you'll join me next week. Same time, same station. Until then, God bless you and God bless your families.
Okay, one last excerpt from Douglas Murray's The Madness of Crowds. I'm almost done with the book, so probably this will be the last one. But the reason I'm posting it is because I got a note from someone today asking if their daughter was trans. I haven't read the comic because I've been working. I just saw it on my phone, but I thought, I have daughters. Is this a conversation I'm going to have to have? Like, my heart goes out to this woman. My first instinct without even reading it is probably the cluster effect. There are a lot of studies going on about how it is becoming widespread in young children and teenagers to identify as gender dysphoria, what the societal incentives are for it, the reasons they're doing it, the pros and cons. Not getting into that right now, but I thought it was interesting because 30 years ago, parents didn't have to deal with this. They didn't have to worry if their kid was trans. I mean, you had the, the minuscule odds of someone being intersex, you know, manifestly born with parts that didn't belong to them, etc. But the fact that this is something parents are worried about in young children Anyway, this excerpt is from someone who went through the trans process and is now reflecting on it. And I think this is important to share with someone in this gal's position. And it reminds me of Walt Heyer, who I interviewed a couple years ago. I'll post the interview in the, in the link and after the video is over, I'll, I'll square it up. Uh, who said when he went through it, it was all one-way traffic, encouragement, praise, support, attaboys. Then when he decided it was a bad idea and he was miserable, crickets on a good day, ridicule and scorn on a normal day. And his advice was someone had should, someone should have loved me enough to say the bridge is out. Don't do anything irreversible. Take your time. Be patient and really consider what's going to happen. So I'll share this video. Give me your thoughts afterwards. But why aren't there enough conversations about, you know what? Someone should have said, stop, hold up. It's not going to be what you think it's going to be. One young man's story. Naturally, this is a sensitive subject, and for that reason I'm going to change the name of the person I'm about to describe. Let us call him James. But the person is real, his case is not uncommon, and he is the sort of person whose story should at least be in the mix in the societal discussion now underway. Now in his twenties, James was born and brought up in the UK. In his mid-teens, he found himself attracted to the gay scene, and to the drag scene in particular. He had a lot of gay friends, and from the age of about sixteen began to spend a lot of time in drag clubs. He liked the people, he liked the scene and its closeness. The people he found there seemed to him almost like a lost generation of people who huddled together in this world because they were worried their parents would disown them if they knew they were gay or liked doing drag. As a result, these people didn't just have fun together, they became like a family. Eventually, James himself started doing a bit of drag. Around this time, he also became very close friends with someone in their early twenties who had transitioned from male to female, a person who seemed to James to be completely fabulous. At around the age of 18, James went to his family doctor and plucked up the courage to tell him, I think I'm in the wrong body. I think I might be a woman. For the year and a half or so after this, he started travelling around seeing different doctors, trying to find one who had a better sense than his family doctor had about what he was actually going through. Finally, at the age of 19, he got a referral to the psychosexual service in Manchester and sat for three and a half hours of psychoanalysis. He was asked about his sex life, his relationship with his parents and much more. In fact, he was slightly taken aback by how intimate the questions were, but the councillor's conclusion in Manchester was clear. You're trans, he was told. And so he was referred to the Gender Identity Clinic at Charing Cross in London. The waiting room there was colourful, with everyone from the very feminine to Bob the Builder in a wig. Six months later, a workshop of around 20 of them were brought together. The consultant gave them the National Health Service's best understanding of what had brought them to that room. They were told, as Dr Benjamin had told Morris, we know it is a problem with the brain, we can't operate on the brain, so we do our best to make the body match the brain. And this then became the NHS's role in dealing with the case of James and others. Six months after that workshop, he had his first one-on-one -on -one interview, which went into considerable detail. There were questions about relationships and work. The all-round stability of the person was obviously important. James saw endocrinologists and had a testosterone reading. The fact that the reading was low on one occasion, in fact it varied at other readings, was taken as proof that there was indeed a trans issue that needed addressing. Looking back, James is struck by a number of things. One is that he was never offered any counselling. How he said he thought he felt was just accepted. And there was another thing. It was all a bit too nice, he says now. There was never any pressure, never any grilling. Two years of living as a member of the opposite sex is taken as proof that the person can go to the next stage. And since the NHS meetings were all six months apart, James came up to his two-year mark after only a few of them. At this stage, the issue of hormone replacement therapy came up. As James says, if you're patient and play the game, it is ridiculously easy to get hormones. You just turn up twice a year and wait. And of course, people in the groups as well as friends on the scene swap stories of how to get to this next stage. James went on oestrogen, which included daily doses as well as injections. 
Accounts from him and from others about the nature of this process hits, among much else, right at the heart of claims that there are no essential differences between the sexes. Indeed, in any other context, the descriptions of the effects of oestrogen on the male body would be considered wildly sexist. James's experience was much like that of others who start taking oestrogen and anti-androgens, testosterone blockers. Among the things that happened was that he became more emotional than he had been before. I cried a lot. His skin began to soften and his body fat began to redistribute. But he noticed other things. The movies, and even the music he liked, began to change, as did what he liked in bed. James took the oestrogen for more than a year. He had been a late developer and there was speculation over whether he had in fact still got a small amount of puberty to go through when he'd begun taking hormones. He also had two meetings, one by Skype and one in person, about the possibility of moving to the next stage. He knew that the backlog of cases meant the NHS couldn't be hurried to this part of the process, but he says that he raised with them the possibility of going for private treatment abroad for gender reassignment surgery. A place in Marbella on the Costa del Sol had been recommended by a number of people, and he says that the NHS neither tried to endorse nor stop him when he mentioned that he was thinking of taking this route. He got information on the costs of procedures, drugs and even flights. I came very close to doing it, he says. I am very glad now that I didn't. Even during the time that he had been on hormones and had been looking to going to the next stage of transitioning, a number of things had begun to preoccupy him. So far, James had only really heard one side of the argument. His friends on the trans scene had shown him a path down which he might go too, and the NHS had not seriously questioned the wisdom of his going down this path. They had treated him as someone with a condition that needed fixing. But online, James sought and found contrary points of view. Through alternative media, he discovered YouTube stars and others who were questioning the wisdom of his decision, including younger and hipper people than he had expected. He was also struggling with his faith. Brought up as a liberal Christian, he went around and around questions of God and design. On the one hand, if God doesn't exist, then my body isn't designed. But he also came to think that people who said that they had been born in the wrong body took a very egocentric view of things, as though this was a challenge that had been given to them. If the whole universe was a coincidence, why do so much so drastically for the sake of changing myself? He began to wonder whether the answer to some of his questions didn't lie in psychology rather than surgery. Specifically, he began to look at what I need to do to be content with my body, not change my body. Of all the consultants he had spoken to, none had engaged him in questions like this. I was never encouraged to look into it too deeply. There was something else which made James begin to wonder whether this was really something that he wanted. As he and others in his circle were well aware, anyone who takes hormones for a period of years will eventually notice effects which are irreversible. These happen around two years of anti-androgen treatment, and as James approached his second year on anti-androgens, he began to feel nervous. The NHS had no emergency appointments for him to consult with a doctor because they were so overwhelmed with people coming to them to consult on gender reassignment. He would have to wait another six months. But James felt that he couldn't wait that long. He faced not only physical changes that risked becoming permanent, but also biological facts. After more than two years on anti-androgens, most men will become infertile and so incapable of ever being able to father a child. James was wondering not only whether he really wanted to become a woman, but also whether he might not one day want to be a father. He had a boyfriend, and the boyfriend was not convinced that James was actually a woman. His boyfriend just thought that James was gay, like him. James himself felt that the hormones were bringing him to the point of being permanent. And so, after considering all of these things unilaterally and without any support or advice from the doctors who had put him on the hormones, James decided to come off them. He described coming off them as very intense. The changes it brought about were much more severe than when he started on the hormones. He suffered terrible mood swings, and while taking oestrogen made him cry more and change his taste in movies, when testosterone came back into his body, it had an equally sexist set of effects. He noticed a lot of common behaviours. He became more angry, more aggressive, and, yes, far more horny. Today, he has been off hormones for more than two years, but the effects of his time transitioning across the sexes is still with him. He thinks he may be just about all right, but he may also be permanently sterile. More immediate is the fact that he still has breasts, or what he refers to as breast tissue. When asked about this, he shyly pulls aside one side of the top of his T-shirt. There is a strap visible. It's a compression vest that he wears at all times in order to try to hide the fact that he has this breast tissue. His clothes are noticeably baggy, and he obviously avoids anything that might be figure-hugging. He thinks he will probably have to have surgery to remove the remaining breast tissue. With some of the perspective afforded by time, he is able to think about his changes over recent years. I do believe transgenderism exists, he says. The sheer volume of people who are moving in this direction at the moment is one thing that suggests that to him. But he says the whole area hasn't been looked at or thought about with nearly enough rigour. The whole idea remains fixed on things as he puts it like, so you don't like rugby. Interesting. 
When he told the psychoanalyst in Manchester that he didn't get on with all the boys at his primary school, the response was, he says, aha, as it was when he told them that as a boy he sometimes dressed in his sister's Pocahontas dress. I've always thought it was curious that the NHS didn't look at wider options, he says, and from the moment that he went to consult the experts, he felt like I was on a conveyor belt. The NHS was overstretched, with only two doctors in the UK doing gender reassignment surgery, one full-time, one part-time. But the doctors were always promising that with around 3,000 people already in treatment and another 5,000 reportedly on the waiting list in the UK, the NHS was busily training up lots more people to deal with the demand. Maybe some patients will hesitate, as James did, when the conveyor belt brings them up to the point of surgery. But even then, as James's baggy clothes attest, the process is not in any way cost-free. James is gay very gay, as he puts it at one stage, and he feels that he has always been a bit of a social chameleon, probably the people I was spending time with had an effect. But he says, I don't want to be one of those people who says that trans makes more trans. It is too close, in his opinion, to the old claim that gay people cause more gay people. But there is something in it, he adds, the thing of my really cool trans friend. He is confused, like everyone else, about what trans may or may not be. If anything, we just need to know more, he says. For instance, why is it the case that suicide rates don't change between pre- and post-op trans? We're running too quickly, he says. It's like a knee-jerk. We're terrified of being on the wrong side of history. But he knows it could have been worse. Looking back at how close he came to surgery, James reflects, I dread to think what position I'd be in now. I don't know if I would be here now. Listening to James's story, which resembles those of many others, one of the things that stands out is how much we pretend to know, but how little we know how fast we appear to be landing on solutions to questions we haven't answered yet. But another thing that stands out is the way in which trans just keeps invading so many of the other controversy-laden subjects of our time. Gay rights campaigners have argued for years that anybody can be gay and that the historical view of gay people being effeminate men and masculine women is not just outmoded and ignorant, but prejudiced and homophobic. And then along comes another rights claim, which is so close that it even gets to share an acronym with gay. But this one suggests something infinitely more undermining than the idea that certain behavioural characteristics are typical of gay people. The trans claim keeps suggesting that people who are slightly effeminate or don't like the right sports are not merely gay, but potentially inhabiting the wrong body and are in fact men or women inside. Given the number of connotations, it is surprising that so few gay men and women have objected to some of the claims that have become embedded in the trans movement. Gay groups have generally agreed that trans rights exist within their orbit, forming part of the same continuum and acronym. Yet many of the claims made by trans do not simply run in contravention to the claims of the gay movement. They profoundly undermine them. Some people are gay, or possibly trans, or the other way round. Get over it. But it isn't just gay that trans runs against. Rather than unlocking the intersections of oppression, as the intersectionalists had claimed, trans simultaneously throws their own movement's aims into the starkest possible relief and produces a veritable pile-up of logical contradictions. <laughs>